So hello, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming to the APM minimum wage webinar from wherever you currently are. Hope you are all doing well. So today we have wonderful speakers, Scott Allard at U University of Washington, David Newmark at University of California, Irvine, and Hillary Wedding uh, from Pennsylvania State University. Uh, we have uh, minimum wage policy experts uh, and in this webinar, we will discuss the impacts of current minimum wage policies and the possible future changes. Uh, each speaker will have 10 minutes for their own talk. And after all this uh, speech, uh, we will have 20 minutes question section. So if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to drop your question in the Q&A. Then we will address your questions uh, after 30 minutes. So, now, here we go. Uh, we will start from Scott Allard. Great, thank you. Um, what, a, what a treat to be here today. Um, the panel, all of us have uh, expertise in this area, in, including our distinguished discussant moderator. Um, so it'll be a good discussion. Um, I just want to say thank you to my co-authors and colleagues here. I'm, I'm representing um, a, a team of folks. Uh, Jenny Romick, uh, James Boscovitz, and Althauser, and Emmy Obara, as well as uh, other members of the Seattle Minimum Wage Study Team, Jake Bigder, Mark Long, Heather Hill, Jen Otten, uh, Hillary Wething, also part of our team. Um, the work you'll see today appeared in Urban Affairs Review and in Social Service Review, and uh, comes from the Seattle Minimum Wage Study. And that study was designed to ask conventional questions about the impact of the higher minimum wage in Seattle around earnings and hours, kind of the conventional um, outcomes. But we also, as a team new to minimum wage research, asked a bunch of other questions that came up in debate or rhetoric around the higher minimum wage, but may not have received as much research attention. And we think these questions are really important because they highlight uh, causal pathways uh, for firm or employer responses. They might reveal heterogeneity. Uh, they also help us think about uh, other policy consequences or effects. And we know that uh, adopting minimum wage laws is a political decision as much as it's something that we think about as an economic impact. And so we tried to create a set of studies and papers that would help people think about downstream consequences broadly. Let me switch my slide. So here's the Seattle minimum wage phase in. Um, I'm just going to sit on this slide for a second. Um, the, the, the minimum wage phased in over a relatively long period of time. It's currently 1669 for the largest firms uh, in Seattle. That'll go up to 1727 in 2022. The state minimum now is almost 14 and it'll go up to about 1450 next year. The state subsequently adopted a, a statewide minimum wage. I'm going to focus uh, today just on the early period uh, for a variety of reasons, mostly because I think that's where we have most confidence in, in understanding impact. Uh, and so these will be just the initial step ups uh, in Seattle. So, you know, different firms, depending on size, exposed to higher wages of 11, 10, uh, or 11, 12, maybe $13 an hour. The study itself has several different components. Um, and uh, Hillary will present from some of the other components today. I'm going to be focused on some surveys and in depth interviews we did with employers right around the time of Faison, just before and just after. We ended up with a survey sample of employers of about 439 that participated in multiple waves of a survey. About 100 of those were nonprofit organizations. We did in-depth interviews with about 29 nonprofit executives and Jenny Roma, who worked on this with me, the, the survey and in-depth interview, she interviewed about the same number of for-profit uh, business owners. We reached almost one in every four nonprofit in the city of Seattle uh, in, in kind of building our sample. And it turned out that most nonprofits we reached uh, didn't have low wage workers. And that was true of our employers too. And we, we drew our uh, sampling frame of employers. Many of the employers in what we thought were affected sectors just simply didn't have low wage workers that were subject to even the first few step ups in the law. So part of what we're thinking about here, the presentation here isn't gonna be about point estimates. It's not gonna be about uh, kind of a, a causal inference. It's gonna be uh, more of a descriptive kind of theoretical conversation around channels of adjustment and what self responses indicate about how firms and nonprofits respond. So as I noted, um, most of the minimum wage research is focused on earnings, uh, hours, jobs, but it's also mostly focused on 
for-profit firms, or at least without a distinction between for-profit firms. There are several commonly identified channels of adjustment. Uh, often we focus on whether people are raising prices in addition to other changes in, in workforce. We might think about uh, relocation, adoption of new technology, maybe reduction of non-wage benefits, other types of channels of adjustment that are commonly identified. But nonprofits actually may not fit into that story very well. And yet we know that nonprofits reach the most vulnerable residents in our communities. They provide critical support services, uh, but they also employ a large number of low wage workers. And so part of the intent here was to think intentionally, in intent to think intentionally about nonprofit organizations and uh, because they matter in, in all kinds of ways. And we should think that the channels of adjustment would be different for nonprofit organizations. First, they don't accumulate profit. So that, that kind of, you know, coping with less profit isn't a, a reasonable channel of adjustment. They're value-driven organizations. They have less discretionary or fungible resources, perhaps fewer slack resources, maybe not as much control over revenue streams and pricing, maybe less able to adjust service provision or just pick up and relocate. Nonprofits are often embedded in their communities. And so being tied to places matters and moving to someplace with a lower minimum wage may be completely counter to what they're about. So we expect, you know, the ability of nonprofits to adjust and to be different. Um, we know that they're critical partners in how we deliver services and programs to a whole bunch of communities. And therefore, there may be reasons to be concerned about what could they do reasonably when the minimum wage went up given exposure. So let me just, we're limited to 10 minutes. So I'm just gonna give you a few key, kind of key findings and some conclusions, and then hopefully in the Q&A we can, uh, Go into greater depth. What did we find? First, um, we found actually that the Seattle law was pretty complicated and at phase and many people didn't understand where they should be. Uh, and I think that's a, an important kind of policy takeaway. What we did find though is that for-profit and nonprofit employers responded similarly, at least in their self-reported responses and surveys and in-depth interviews. Most employers were already near or above the early step-ups, which made adjustments perhaps easier in Seattle than in other places. But the primary response of firms was to increase wages and then maybe to make some slight adjustments to staffing, maybe slightly more adjustments among for-profit firms, the nonprofit employers, but there was no evidence of closures or relocations, contracting out. We didn't see dramatic reductions in non-wage benefits, again, according to self-reports. For-profit firms did raise prices and that was their primary adjustment. That was kind of dominant, even above trimming staff or hours. On the nonprofit side, we found modest changes to staffing, modest changes to service provision, uh, modest increases in fees charged. Um, and really what, what organizations were trying to do was navigate and adjust a difficult situation where they had to elevate wages, not just of low and low wage workers or entry level workers, but to avoid compression and to kind of maintain internal wage ladders. They had to raise benefits or uh, I mean, uh, hourly wages of other employees. And so that created all kinds of kind of short-term challenges and adjustments. And so there were little tweaks here or there, uh, reallocating resources in some places, um, modifying service provision, maybe relying on volunteers a little bit more. But we didn't see big changes overall in practice. We didn't see relocation. We didn't see uh, a, a decrease in services. And so we didn't see perhaps what many people feared was uh, a large loss of nonprofit effort or capacity. So. Well, how do we make sense of all this? Well, one, I think the, the lack of immediate response and the, the lack of kind of big negative effects makes real sense, right? The initial step ups weren't as severe as we expected. We did allow firms and employers to adjust over time. Many firms made anticipatory moves. We had this in our in-depth interviews uh, throughout, people talking about how they saw this coming and they made decisions ahead of the law so that they didn't have to lay people off. Many employers, both for-profit and nonprofit, talked a lot about how they tried to avoid layoffs and the work that they did to try to maintain their staffing. Um, we think these findings though are pretty consistent with what David and Hillary will present later with uh, other types of data that look at economic effects uh, overall. We know that uh, simple phased in policy designs probably work best. Uh, I also think something that's applied evenly across sectors works well too, uh, because all these organizations are in competitive labor markets. And in fact, actually the biggest thing nonprofits would talk about was how difficult it was to compete for labor. Uh, when, the, when the minimum wage went up, they felt like their advantage um, uh, in hiring may have dissipated a little bit. Um, we know that nonprofits 
also are tied to kind of blocky or very fixed contracts and reimbursement rates. And so because minimum wage laws are community commitments to supporting workers, I think our team also believes that there should be a community commitment to ensuring that contracts and reimbursement rates are adjusted. Seattle tried to do some of that. They had a little bit of a rainy day fund of sorts uh, for firms to draw or nonprofits to draw on. Um, but I think there's more to do and more we should intentionally talk about in that space. I think one of the fundamental realities here though is that at the time the minimum wage went into effect, it was a big item on everybody's agenda. But in subsequent years, it became kind of a little piece, really nobody's talking about it as much as they did four or five years ago. Issues of supply chain today, labor market competition, the Trump administration, uh, COVID, um, other changes to funding streams and reimbursement rates, the prospect of large federal investments, all these things changed the playing field. And so, you know, really in, in many ways, the minimum wage became something that was important for a short period of time, but then faded into the background of the many things that organizations think about. Um, our findings are limited to self-reports into the findings of a single city. Happy to talk about that. But I think we have a lot of ideas about future research. There should be greater attention to how firms and nonprofits adjust and to the channels of adjustment that are available. We should be thinking about strategic planning efforts, uh, efforts to modify internal wage structures, how organizations might think about overtime and salary positions, whether there's downstream consequences for service provision, and ultimately, I think where we're going as a team is trying to think about the impact of higher minimum wages, both on poverty and also on program participation among those at the lower end of the uh, labor market. Thank you very much. With that, I will turn it over to my good colleague, David Newmark. If I unmute, you'll hear me better. Do you see my slides? Good. Okay. We only have 10 minutes. I feel like I should I should talk like when they do the um, the side effects on radio ads for drugs, you know, where they cut out all the blank spaces um, and we can make it quicker. So um, this is joint work with Pete Shirley. He was a student of mine. He's now like the director of the equivalent of the CEA for the state of West Virginia, which is probably a pretty interesting job. Um, this is a somewhat snarky title, especially in light of the, uh, the Nobel Prize last week, but so it goes. Um, so let me tell you what we're what we're doing here. If I can get my slides to change, there we go. Um, so I'm going to really jump in quickly. You know, what are the key arguments for raising the minimum wage in the U.S.? Um, a higher minimum wage will help low wage workers. A higher minimum wage will reduce poverty. I mean, those are, I think, I think at the end of the day, uh, the two key arguments. Um, large literature has about addressed both of these questions. I think there's far more work on the first. I would second what Scott just said. Would need more work on the second. Um, because I think most of us, I, I mean, and Scott's work says this, you know, we, we might disagree on magnitudes. Most of us think there are some benefits to raising a higher minimum wage and some costs. And then obviously what the question becomes, how big are they? And even more importantly, when we're talking about poverty, on whom do those costs and benefits fall? Um, and I don't think we have a, 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 as much work on that as we need. Um, so a lot of work on, there's of course a lot of work on job loss and that's what this paper is about. So I'll tell you, I wrote this paper. It's kind of a weird story, not a weird story, but you know, when, you're, when you've been working on a topic for, I won't say how long, um, you get a lot of papers sent to you, the referee, just you know, people sending them randomly, they pop up on Google Scholar and you take a look. And the minimum wage literature, um, it's funny because when I was a first year grad student, a first year labor econ student, so second year grad school, uh, Jim Medoff said, don't study minimum wages, we know everything, waste of time. Um, and uh, no matter what happens, the flow keeps getting bigger and bigger. Um, but I would, you know, I frankly found it impossible to keep up. Um, and some papers come across and say there is job loss, and some papers come across and say there isn't. And occasionally they say there's there's job gains. Um, but I kind of had a, if, if someone said to me, okay, so all these new papers, you know, what do they say? Um, what's the answer? I I could say, well, the answer's all over the place, but that's not a very satisfactory answer. So we kind of wanted to summarize all this evidence in a certain way, and that's what we were we were trying to do in this paper. And I will actually um, skip. Uh, well, I'll, I'll skip to, to this to this point. Um, uh, that, let's say, uncertainty about what all the literature actually said was coupled with uh, a claims I see, I saw, and still see frequently that says, you know, we know that minimum wages in the U.S. don't reduce employment. Um, now, I knew that wasn't true of every paper, obviously, including my own, but not just my own. Um, but I also didn't have a good sense, and neither did Pete, and that's why we're in interested in doing this, and whether most of the evidence for the U.S. was now saying that or not. So we, we, we honestly went into this very open-minded. Um, 
So the goal of this paper, unlike a lot of other stuff I've done recently, it's not to adjudicate between different studies, not to say who's right, who's wrong, what about this method, what about that method. It's just to try to clarify and figure out what the overall literature says. Um, it's not really a meta-analysis. The paper itself discusses the differences, but in a short presentation, I won't get into this. Now, this seems like an odd question, right? Why is it hard to answer the question of what the literature says? Well, let me just make the case with this slide that in the minimum wage literature, <laughs> we really need this, right? This is, these are three examples of something like 15 or more in the paper, and there's more. And I won't read them to you because you can read them on your own. These slides will be posted. Um, but you see quotes supporting all three positions. One is there is no job loss, right? Pretty decisively. Um, the other, this is actually from Cardin Kruger, the sort of the, the 20th edition, 20th anniversary edition, I think, of their book, um, saying not equally mixed, you know, just as many positive and negative, uh, equally likely to be positive and negative. And then, and then quotes that say, you know, it, you know, the preponderance of the evidence, no one says all of the evidence, but the preponderance of evidence points to job loss. So it's kind of unusual what's going on here, right? It's certainly not at all odd that people do studies and reach different conclusions in those studies. I think it's weird, maybe I'm wrong, that we don't even agree on the summaries of the studies, right? We're all, and, and that's, that's an objective fact, right? Uh, you could, now you could say at the end of the day, I believe these studies more than those studies, fine, and I'll come back to that. Um, but we thought it was useful because when you have all these different summaries of the same body of literature, you know, they can't all be right. Uh, so that's what we're, we set out to do. Um, so we put together a database and here's the, the broad parameters. Um, we took all papers published in the so-called new minimum wage research, which basically starts with a 92 ILR symposium now called ILR review. Um, uh, and basically, those are the papers that started using something other than time series data. It's not an exact split, but, you know, became much more predominant. We go, we go to a couple other surveys to make sure we, you know, to get these papers. We did a, a Google search and we, ex we explained what the protocol is. Uh, we excluded pure time series studies. And then we did a little bit of crowdsourcing, like when we put the first version up on Twitter and said, anyone know of any papers or people told us if we didn't ask um, that we missed, got a few more that way. We end up with 70 papers. So basically you wanna think about these as, this is US literature only, um, papers that are using some version of regional variation or some other kind, not just time series variation um, and, uh, and published or forthcoming just because others can change and it's even harder to, to know whether you've got the full set of the, of the not published papers yet. Okay. Um, we focused on the author's conclusions. We didn't just tabulate all the estimates like people do in a meta-analysis. We really wanted to say, what do these papers find? And we have these sort of rules we established for how do we figure out what the author's conclusion was? I won't bore you with that, but you can read it. Um, we also, to make sure we were not, you know, uh, uh, you know, having our own, our own perception bias here, um, we actually uh, surveyed the authors and almost all of them responded and asked them, what are their preferred estimate or estimates? Um, uh, we compared them, we, we, you know, we used our own in a few cases where we didn't get a response. We got a pretty good response rate, only nine non-responses out of the 70 papers. Um, uh, there was no, no clear difference between what we had coded and what they told us. Obviously, we didn't all agree exactly. We always used what the authors told us if they, if they responded. Um, so here's, here's the graph, and I, 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 kinda, I think this is a great graphic. So don't try to read the text on the left, obviously. Um, I, I'll show you some graphs where they the bars get bigger and the text gets bigger. This is just all the studies. And what I've done here is simply arrayed the studies by elasticity. And you can see where zero is and you can see the mean and the median. Um, they're about minus 0.1 and minus 0.13 or something in this graph. And I show you uh, insignificant, marginally significant, 10% level, whatever that label should be, and 5% level. Um, uh, you know, I mean, there's an obvious lesson here, right? Most of the research points to negative effects, right? Um, you know, look where these things cross the zero line. It's around here. A couple other things to notice. Obviously, there's a lot of, you know, obviously the one, the estimates near zero tend to be insignificant for obvious reasons. Um, up here, they tend to almost always be significant. Some of the really big positives are actually not very strongly significant, including, including these bars here, which are sort of, I'm kind of peering over my camera, 0.3 elasticities, you know, up, up to these, these sort of, you know, incredibly large positive elasticities. Um, uh, just a few more details. So 79% of them are negative, you know, 47% are negative and significant at the 5% level. If you do a simple calculation and said you just, you know, what is the probability of finding a negative estimate in a study if, if the true effect is zero um, and treat it as a simple binomial problem, which is completely wrong statistically, but a useful heuristic, you know, you clearly reject 
um, sort of the, the notion that studies should on average uh, yield no effect. Um, okay. Um, this is just the median estimate from each study because so this one is a little more visible studies report some studies report multiple estimates, but the graph looks pretty much the same. Uh, this I think is an interesting graph. So what did I do here? I just changed the order. How did I change the order? Well, I, I arrayed them chronologically, right? Um, from uh, earliest at the top to latest at the bottom. So card. So there's three card papers right up here. Um, card and Kruger's right up there, uh, right here. Um, because people say, oh, well, you know, the literature has evolved and we used to think the effects were negative and now we don't. Well, you look at this graph and you don't see that at all. In fact, the bigger, you know, so this is uh, Carden Kruger is right. Um, I'm trying to read this and it is so right here. Katz and Kruger is right here. Um, you know, the, the big positive estimates were actually very early. Um, if you if you actually compute the correlation to run a regression, there's, there's absolutely no slope here. Right. There's, there's no no indication that. Um, somehow we are, as we learn more or run better studies or run different studies, I'm not, I'm not getting into the better uh, argument. Um, our, our, our view is changing. Um, okay. Uh, we then explore a bunch of different kinds of variation. We look at the studies that use federal variation, but kind of variation across different sort of workers. Um, again, are, are using different statement and wages. We use ones that just use the state variation. We look at just sort of the case studies, like a treated area or a synthetic control. Um, and we say here, as I point out here, the, the, the first two are largely predominant negative. The case studies have smaller elasticities. They are, they are a little more in the middle, 65% uh, negative, still, still the majority, but you know, not a huge, not as big a number. Um, I think the variation by type of worker is most interesting. When you look at teens or young adults, you get somewhat more negative estimates. Uh, when you look at the less educated, even more so, and I'll, I'm obviously flying through this, you can look at the paper. When you look at low wage industries, and there are a number of retail and restaurant studies, the effects are much closer to zero. So that's the one big difference. So here's the graph for the less educated. I'll just fly through these real quickly. Um, uh, but here's the graph for the low wage industries. You know, if the, if the whole literature looked like that, you might say, huh, equally likely to be positive, negative, centered on zero might not be a crazy conclusion. But that's a small set of studies, and it's low wage industries, and that's very important. Um, I think the way to think about this is is um, you know, a low wage industry by definition is a lot of high wage workers, right? I mean, not, or higher wage workers, not high wage workers. Um, and there can be labor, labor substitution between those workers. And that substitution in a sense has to be within industry. I mean, if the restaurant substitutes away from the, the least skilled workers who are now made more expensive, they're obviously hiring more workers at the same restaurant. Whereas you think about sort of what happens to teenagers or young adults, maybe some get jobs and some lose jobs because the higher skilled teens get drawn into the market. Um, but that's not going to be as clearly focused on the low wage industry, which may explain why we tend to see zero gross or some closer to zero gross effects when we look at an industry, even though the net effects on the least skilled um, might be bigger. I think the industry question is interesting. If you want to say, what will the minimum wage do to this industry? Um, it's perhaps less interesting from a policy question because it's just not the aggregate. Um, uh, if you look at directly affected workers, so these are papers, there's far fewer of these. It one way or another, try to say, you know, let's just isolate those who, let's say, started out, you know, in panel data um, below the new minimum or something, you know, some version of that. Um, then things look really negative. Um, elasticities are bigger, and the studies pretty unanimously point in that direction. Uh, that doesn't surprise me. I've said a long time for a long time. There's a difference between the net and gross effects, and to the extent you're trying to help the least skilled, these may be the, the most relevant elasticities. Um, so. What do we conclude? Uh, you know, I think there's two points in, in the title of the slide. The research concludes that minimum wage reduce employment. That is most of it does. Big caveat, unless you discard a lot of it. Now you may want to discard a lot of it. You may only believe a subset of studies and that subset of studies may point in a particular direction. Um, uh, but that means we need to, to sort of change the discussion or the summaries of the literature or how we present this to policymakers and not sort of make these blanket statements that, oh yeah, the research shows minimum wages don't reduce employment, but you have to actually make the case why we believe a certain kind of study. I have other work, I haven't gone through it into these slides, but I do in, in other papers, that suggests that, you know, uh, to, to a large extent, and this I think is an interesting question, the studies that use so-called close controls, right, cross-border county pairs, some of these Seattle, I mean, you, you do a bit of that in, in Seattle studies, some of the other folks in this panel, those are the studies that are tending to find weaker effects and the studies that don't restrict the closed controls are much more likely to find negative effects. Um, and there's a question of whether closed controls necessarily uh, 
um, reduce bias. It's not clear they do. And I discussed that in some other work. I'm happy to get into that later. Now, let me just finish by saying, uh, just because I believe, and most of the literature I think says, um, minimum wage reduced employment doesn't mean it's a bad policy. It gets back to what I said before. It just means there's a cost and we have to weigh those costs against the benefits. And we can do that looking at workers by looking at wage and employment and hours elasticities. I think it's even more important to do that looking at poverty where the incidence of these effects actually uh, 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 plays a role and, and could be an important role. Thanks. Okay, can you all see my slides? Great. Um, thank you, David and Scott, for such interesting talks. Um, and thank you, APM, for having me here. Uh, as Scott mentioned, um, I had the privilege to be a part of a really great and interdisciplinary team that comprehensively studied Seattle's minimum wage. Um, and I'm actually not going to spend too much time on this slide, since Scott gave a really nice overview, uh, but you can see the wage schedule uh, is on the right. And the big thing to keep in mind is the wage increase varied both by business size and employer provided benefits. And I give a brief summary of the main findings from the evaluation that we found you know, to date on the left. I was principally involved in the administrative data analysis, which estimated the impact of Seattle's minimum wage on employment outcomes, both for workers who were employed at the time the minimum wage law was passed and on the whole uh, low wage labor market as a whole. Uh, very briefly, we broadly found that the minimum wage improved the wages and earners of workers who were employed at the time the ordinance went into effect, while reducing the number of hours worked, particularly for workers with less experience, um, as well as the number of new entrants into the low-wage labor market. Other members of the team have investigated the impacts of the minimum wage on firm opening and closings, investigated how minimum wage impacted prices, surveyed employers, and interviewed workers. Um, so a lot has been done on the Seattle minimum wage. To stay true to the spirit of this webinar, which is on future directions, I'm going to talk about two active lines of inquiry that I think, you know, in addition to Scott's research on nonprofits and David's findings on the minimum wage literature are really important to consider when we as researchers evaluate labor policy. And the first asks how the minimum wage affects workers' economic stability. The second asks how workers come to know about the minimum wage policy. I'm going to focus on each of these in order. And so with this first inquiry, which asks about how the minimum wage affects workers' economic stability, I use that phrase stability to reflect the fact that workers' experience of employment is not just based in their employment status, but rather it's also about the quality and the temporality of the job. And I think this question is really important right now, given the vast amount of evidence that's come forth both from sociological and economic literatures about how volatile and precarious the low wage labor market is, you know, as well as like the recent news of workers quitting on mass and employers reporting not being able to retain workers. The low wage labor market is often characterized by high rates of job turnover and by hours volatility. And that can be due to scheduling practices that leave workers working few hours one period and a ton the next, or um, due to the rise in sort of temporary work or involuntary part-time work. Given that many of these low wage jobs are hourly jobs, Obs, oftentimes these fluctuations, particularly fluctuations in hours, can lead to fluctuations in earnings. And this type of instability is really stressful. Um, it's stressful to workers and it can also affect their overall economic security. You know, workers that are in low income households definitionally lack the savings, the assets, and the access to credit that's needed to buffer negative fluctuations. Their employment is a key part of their overall economic success. Um, we also know that job turnover is really costly for employers due to the costs associated with recruitment and training, short staffing, um, or low employee morale surrounding departures. So policies that can reduce job turnover have the potential, I think, to be a real win-win. Um, and as an entry point into this research, work by Aaron Dubé and colleagues found that teenagers and restaurant workers experienced reductions in job turnover in response to minimum wages. And in our paper using the administrative data, we found that workers were more likely to be employed at their baseline employer in response to the minimum wage, suggesting that this policy can be one pathway to create more 
um, employment stability. So in a new project, I'm expanding on this question to investigate the impact of the Seattle minimum wage ordinance on employment flows. Um, and by employment flows, I really mean hires and separations. And then I'm also investigating several measures of hours volatility that can happen on the job for the entire low wage workforce in Seattle. And so the way that I'm going to do this is I'm going to compare employment outcomes in Seattle to those in the rest of Washington using a difference in difference design. And I estimate counterfactual outcomes using a generalized synthetic control method. Um, I'm interested here in several outcomes, although for today I'm going to focus on the impact of the minimum wage on hours and separations, as well as the number of quarter to quarter large drops in hours worked for a given job. These large changes, so changes that are greater than 25% in hours from quarter to quarter, um, are a pretty standard way to investigate volatility because they're viewed as fluctuations that are large enough to impact the well being of households. Um, and just to show you some very preliminary evidence, uh, but we, I am finding uh, that both hires, separations, and hours drops do decline in response to Seattle's minimum wage. And so each of these graphs show year-over-year -year change in Seattle in black, the counterfactual synthetic control in the bolded blue, and the raw data for each region, and that's in sort of that light uh, blue and gray thin lines. The vertical line in each of these graphs demarcates the period before and after the minimum wage policy passed. And when I think about the post period, I'm also staying in this two to three years right after the minimum wage passed up until 2016 quarter three, because Washington state increased its minimum wage shortly after that. Um, we can see that how, uh, hours, or excuse me, hires dropped by an average of around 7.2%, separations dropped by an average of 6.8%, and the number of large hours declines a worker experienced within a given job dropped by 4.5%, suggesting that employment has become both more stable within a given job and that these jobs might be lasting longer. Um, my next step with this research will be to investigate measures of volatility to account for the frequency and magnitude of hours volatility, as well as looking in heterogeneity by job tenure. Okay, oops, sorry. Uh, the second line of inquiry that I see for minimum wage research examines the rules of the law and the implementation of the law more carefully. And so the guiding question here is how workers come to know about or have access to the policy at hand. And this question is based on the qualitative component of the Seattle minimum wage study that's headed by Heather Hill, which was created in part to assess worker knowledge of the law. I think this question is important because oftentimes, you know, particularly in quantitative policy evaluation, which I do a lot of, uh, we assume that the policy was fully implemented to the full intent of the law. And in reality, that just doesn't always happen. A great example of this uh, actually came from research by Julia Goodman and co-authors, and they show that low-income women in San Francisco were less likely to access their new right to paid family leave in part because they didn't know about the law or understood or understood how the law worked for them. Um, many new labor regulations like Seattle's minimum wage are really complicated and they include clauses around varying tiers of eligibility or varying firm size thresholds. In Seattle, employers have the burden to communicate those new laws to workers and that implies they need to fully understand the law in order to implement it. Additionally, in Seattle, there's also a burden on the workers to enforce the law um, through calling a hotline the Office of Labor Standards set up to file anonymous complaints. Workers thus have the burden to correctly know their wage and feel secure enough in their job not to fear retribution for calling on their employer. So there's a lot of pieces there. And one way that we're able to assess worker knowledge is by the use of qualitative methods, such as in-depth interviews, um, which can uncover mechanisms and help us understand the ways in which organizations might be using formal or informal rules to implement the policy. And so uh, Heather and I are gonna do just that. We are asking what the source and accuracy and depth of knowledge workers have um, about the Seattle minimum wage and specifically, we look at uh, workers in low-paying jobs. And you know, from the administrative burden literature, we know that uneven implementation can often exclude workers who are the most vulnerable. So we assess this knowledge by the immigrant status of the worker as well. 
Um, to do this, we uh, recruited 55 participants from the community and uh, conducted in-depth interviews in three waves. So three in 2015 through 2017, we interviewed these workers. The interviews were around an hour and a half to two hours, and they covered, I mean, a, quite a bunch of things, much more than just the Seattle minimum wage. We asked them about low-wage work, making ends meet, their family life, um, and then we coded these interviews, um, had them transcribed and uh, did some analysis. The key thing for the workers was they had to be working in Seattle um, and earning less than $15 an hour and have a family income that was less than 50,000 and have children in the home. And you can see from our sample, I mean, this table is really small, but I just wanna point out two things. First, the sample is disproportionately female and disproportionately uh, foreign born. So 60% of the sample are workers who are immigrants and 80% of the sample are women. Um, this gives us the opportunity to address um, the burden, to sort of assess whether or not the burden of the labor regulations differs by the identity of the worker. And our preliminary analysis shows that while many workers in wave one, that's sort of the beginning of the minimum wage when the minimum wage first went into effect, um, many of those workers, around 72%, had vague or no knowledge of the law at the time the ordinance passed. Uh, workers who were immigrants were way more likely to have vague or no knowledge. So 91% of immigrant workers in our sample had vague or no knowledge of the law. And that's compared to around 40% of the US workers who were foreign born. An example of this vague knowledge um, is given with the quote on the right. And this is from Hannah, again, not real names, um, who is a janitor and an immigrant who, when we asked him what he knew about the minimum wage, said, I heard people talking about the minimum wage law in Seattle, $15 an hour, but it wasn't me. Me, I worked for 11 and some, and also my two sons, they work for somewhere less than $15. But I heard about people were talking, I don't know specifically when or where. So a lot of the workers reported kind of hearing something about 15, but not really understanding how the law might affect them. In the second wave of interviews, we followed up with these workers and we asked whether or not their employer had said anything to them about the law. This was part of the law, the employers had to communicate it. And many of them reported their employer said nothing. And so, you know, across the whole sample, around 62% indicated that their employers did not communicate about the minimum wage. However, amongst our immigrant sample, the share that reported their employer did not communicate was 74%. By contrast, 44% of US born workers reported having no communication. And an example of these responses um, we got was from Robert, who works as a cook at the stadium. Um, and when we asked him what their employer said anything to them, he said, well, we make $13 an hour at the stadium last year. And then this year, I think we're making 13 still, but I don't know. They really don't talk about it because like I said, we just show up at the site and everybody goes to work. Maybe they talk about it on those labor jobs down there, but those event jobs, they never talk about the, because we're making 13 an hour at the stadium, but over at the baseball stadium is different pay. But this year they might've raised it because I did hear they was going to raise it last year. So I don't know. It's not, it's like a secret, a quiet secret. No one really talks about that stuff when I thought they should. I think they should. Um, so really powerful um, sentiments here. Uh, just to sum up, I see some very exciting possibilities in the minimum wage research and frankly in social policy research more broadly. There's two avenues I'm interested in working on at the moment. Um, and those are thinking about how uh, we can include measures of flow into our analysis and our policy evaluations of the minimum wage in order to understand the degree to which um, labor policy can stabilize employment. Uh, the second piece I think too is being mindful that for all of our policy to be correctly implemented, we need it to be, um, we need to understand who's missing out from the policy and who's actually gaining access into the policy. Um, and so I think one way that we can continue to do this is to consider investigating policy implementation and participant knowledge in future policy evaluations. Uh, I look forward to talking about all of this in Q&A, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for all the great presentations.
So we have received four questions so far, and so we will go through one by one uh, by the time order. The first question is to Scott from David Newmark, and his question is, how much do you think the additional funds for nonprofits reduce the adjustments of these organizations made? So how much how much did the additional funds affect nonprofit behavior? Is that is that essentially the question? Exactly. Yeah, how, much, how much do they do they do they result in you know not as much adjustment as you might have expected? Yeah, it's it's a it's an interesting question. So one of the realities for nonprofit organizations is they pull money from all kinds of different grant and contract mechanisms, and only a small percentage of them are local in terms of city or county. And so the amount of money available is modest because those contracts are generally small, and it's only really accessible to a small number of providers, those operating in human services. We had several of those in our in our survey sample and in our in-depth interviews. Um, I think many of the firms didn't actually even take it up. Some of it was because they weren't aware of it, and some of it was because it didn't seem necessary, and they felt like that was something that other people should get. It's kind. It was. It had the same feel for when when folks who are eligible for public programs kind of demur enrollment because that's you know other people are more in need than we are. Or I am, and I think I think that was kind of one of the messages here. Um, what it underscored to me though was that there wasn't um, that mechanism as as great as it was probably wasn't hitting. Uh, the Medicaid reimbursements, state reimbursements, grants from philanthropy, which may not have expanded automatically. Thanks for the question, David. Thank you, Scott. So we go to now we go to the next question uh, by David again uh, to Hillary. <laughs> Thank you for wonderful questions, David. <laughs> so the next question is. Oh, so regarding the job security, so we a lot of works have shown that we get less job exit and less job entry. So in a sense, uh, more stability is not clearly good for those who have trouble finding in trouble finding jobs. How do you would you like to address this? I think that's a great question. Um, and to be perfectly frank with you, it's something I'm still thinking through. You know, I think one of the pieces that we need to consider, um, at least at this moment, when I think about how this affects policy, is um, it seems very clear that improving the quality of work will lead to more workers staying on the job longer. And so, in my mind, that's kind of first and foremost. My, like, sort of my working theory. Um, although certainly up for kind of suggestions or thoughts on this, is that, you know, if that's true, if we sort of improve the quality of work, potentially, you know, workers stay on longer. I think that really does have the opportunity to save employers money. You know, there's this like really great jolly study from this year that talked about all the costs that employers incur from job turnover. Um, and that too could then lead to either more labor openings or other ways in which um, workers are able to gain access into the labor market. Um, but in terms of like what happens in the immediate, I totally take your point that it, it does mean that less entry and less exit does mean less entry. And then I think the question then also comes in, and this is like more of a policy question, so not necessarily a question like we can answer as uh, researchers, but who is excluded, right? And so a lot of times I've been thinking about this, like in terms of demographics, like, is it the teenager that's excluded or is it the single mom of three? Um, so like when we did our administrative data, you know, we found that it was new entrants that were excluded. And I think that has different consequences for thinking about whether or not kind of Pareto, the policy is good, than if it's excluding the single mother of three who really depends on that job. Um, so both matter, I think. Uh, but I totally take your point. It is something that we need to kind of continue to reckon with when we have conversations around stability. Okay, thank you, Hilary. And now we will go to more questions from audience. So uh, the question, uh, one of the audience asked, uh, what do we know, if anything, about the impact of minimum wage on inflation? And David will answer this question. Sure. Uh... I mean, it hasn't gotten a lot of attention. There's the, in in, our, in my my book with Washer, which is now getting older. Uh, we do have a chapter on it, and 
we don't really find anything. I mean, the way to think about it is it's, you know, I mean, yes, there's there is pass through. I mean, Scott reported on some of his pass through evidence. There's lots of evidence of price pass through to some extent. Um, but that's a one time change. Right. So there's nothing. You know, remember inflation is 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 is, is the is a, what we what we care about is the rate of price increase goes up and stays up. Um, and there's no reason the minimum wage does that and really not much evidence that. I mean, I, my first job was at the Fed. So we used to actually talk about this because obviously that's, you know, that's their ballywick. And and Washer and I, um, based on what we we didn't do any in original work on inflation, but based on what we looked at, um, very, very little evidence that that was a concern. Obviously, if you, you know, what's what's new in some of the local minimum wages and state minimum wages and including Seattle's is indexation, right? And in the past, we have had, uh, well, the federal minimum wage obviously isn't indexed. It hasn't gone up for a long time. And most states are still not. So when you index it, of course, um, then you are building in uh, increases in prices. Um, you know, but but few most of is my understanding is almost every case of an index minimum wage, um, they may have done a big jump initially, but then they're indexed to the CPI or or something, you know, something close. So I don't think we we are, we've yet seen a policy of aggressively raising, um, you know, sort of committing to year after year increases in, um, you know, the minimum wage relative to an average wage or price level or something like that. Still mainly a one time shock. Thank you for the answer, David. And one more question is, has anyone identified specific impacts of minimum wage increases on employment in nursing homes and other low wage care work? Particularly, what has been the impact on staffing and retention of workers in those industries? Scott will answer this question. Yeah, and I welcome others. I, yeah, actually, the, the, the question about the prices is interesting. We, we, we had modest price increases, but actually, you know, it's hard to get really good data on that over time. Um, but I do know that in the worker study that, that Hillary was part of with Heather, folks are really worried about prices going up. And I think that was true in Seattle where everything was getting more expensive. The minimum wage was really a trivial con contributor to that. But in terms of um, nursing home long, long uh, term care work, actually Hillary and I started to think about this in the admin data we had here in Seattle. We didn't find a lot in the employer uh, surveys or in the in-depth interviews to suggest that there were big changes, although that's an area you'd expect to be, um, to be really exposed. And one of the realities, that, and Hillary, you can correct me on this if I'm wrong, is that in the admin data, it was hard to get enough sample outside of Seattle, essentially, to create comparison groups. And so in a kind of a case study or kind of a statewide kind of analysis, we, were, we kind of struggled to be able to do the kind of same synthetic control that we would have wanted to have done to have kind of parallel findings. And that happens, I think, as you start to go into industry sectors um, in one place. Is, am, am I remembering that correctly? Hillary? Yeah, no, just to chime in on two things. I, I mean, everything Scott said is correct. We, with the nursing home and care in particular, um, we actually, there was a data abnormality essentially with one of those industries that was like really big. And so we just didn't even want to mess with it. And we exclude it like from our aggregate analysis that um, we've put out uh, because we didn't feel that comfortable with it. I think it's actually though, both like nursing homes and care work are like, I think two big avenues of like low wage sectors that are really understudied. Um, there's a lot more energy around there, which is great. But uh, yeah, Scott and I talked about it. I think it's a really great idea. Someone should do it. Um, but the data that we had was not uh, available for that. The other thing I just wanted to jump jump in about the prices piece, um, kind of speaking more to the qualitative work that um, Heather had it up and that she and I have been able to work on was looking at um, when we asked workers sort of their opinions about the minimum wage, a lot of them were very nervous about prices going up. And particularly many of those workers are on section eight, which is housing affordability. And so for them, when their wages go up, they're losing access to Section 8 housing, like it just goes down incrementally. And so like, I think another piece of the minimum wage conversation is it's just not a silver bullet for any of these pieces, like for sort of the general question of how do we improve the livelihood of low-wage workers? Like it is one policy lever and a really important one, obviously, I mean, we're having this panel on it, but the minimum wage alone may not be the only policy that's needed in order to improve the lives of those workers or potentially bring them out of very low wages. Um, especially because the way that the government benefit structures are working, oftentimes when their wages increase incrementally, 
they're losing that much in safety net benefits. Yeah, can I just Hillary, the data there? abnormality? We should like make it. It was. It's just that they put um, home health care workers in our UI system here. Uh, I mean, um, in you know, family members who are caring for others go into our UI system here for some reason, and they report no hours and no earnings, and it's a funky thing. And that, but that was the data abnormality. It wasn't like there was some. You know, oh yeah, that's true. So I didn't mean to. There was some. <laughs> no, no, we have a lot of incompetence in our state, but that wasn't one of them. Right, so. that's true. <laughs> there is there is more there is quite a bit of work on nursing homes actually so so Macon and Manning have some work on kind of employment and hours adjustments in the UK and there's this paper by Rafini I don't know if it's published yet where she it's kind of getting at this um kind of safe stuff Hilary was talking about you know does does a higher minimum wage increase the quality of jobs and efficiency wage story and incentivizes harder work or or whatever and that paper actually finds lower mortality, which is, you know, pretty good quality measure. Um, you would think from, you know, if you want to measure what nursing homes are supposed to do is keep people alive, right? That's, um, that's one of their jobs. Um, I think, you know, I think there's a really interesting question here, right? So I think this issue, and, you know, we now have lots of evidence um, more today that, that when the minimum wage is up, people don't leave jobs, which suggests the jobs are better. We have some of these measures of higher productivity. I have a student working on um, uh, text from, from restaurant uh, reviews that says staff get friendlier when the minimum wage goes up, which is kind of an interesting result. Um, I think they're really, and, and then there's a the turnover part of that as well. I think one of the really interesting questions is, is the following, right? Uh, my response to that argument before we had much evidence used to be, well, if it's better for firms to pay higher wages because their workers won't turn over or they'll be happier or they'll steal less or whatever, uh, why do they need the government to tell them to do it? Why don't they just do it on their own? Um, and I think an interesting question, which I've never seen addressed, is, is there a sort of coordination problem, right? On the one hand, if I just raise my wage and nobody else does, I might get a bigger turnover response, right? Because now, now my job becomes particularly valuable to workers. Um, on the other hand, no one else has higher costs from doing that, um, and there may be a problem. Whereas if the government sort of forces a bunch of low-wage employers to do it at the same time, maybe we get some of those gains, but I don't have the same competitive disadvantage I would by doing it myself. So I, I'm sort of curious about this minimum wage as a, you know, sometimes a coordination mechanism for getting to uh, some for for creating some improvement in the quality of jobs. Subject to the issue we were discussing before that that may price the least skilled out of the labor market. You know, depending on if it creates more job openings or not. Thank you. So we are a little over time, but uh, APM said we can go a little bit more. So we will handle the last question. Uh, to will be addressed by Scott. What do we know, if any, about how the Seattle minimum wage law affects the near Seattle area? Did you also survey employers and workers in near Seattle area? We did, and we have some working papers. I was just typing a message to to uh, to this question, um, which I'll finish here after I after I get off the video. Um, we we have a few working papers. Um, uh, Mark Long's working on a spillover paper. We have employer survey data that's in um, firms outside the city and inside the city. Um, and we don't, see, we don't see big differences, partly because there were spillover effects in the suburbs. And there were a lot of firms that had sites in the city and sites outside the city. And they felt like you know, they, they might have had to have raised, it, raised the wage for everybody. Um, but uh, those, those, are, those are kind of working papers that, that we don't have uh, results for, for uh, prime time viewing yet. But um, Keep keep track of our minimum wage study site, which I put in the chat, and um, and also feel free to email me directly, and we're happy to to share work as it becomes available. I, I don't know if others have questions or answers on Hillary or Oh Young. I would just say I, I think you I think I would encourage you and other people think about this to really think about the sector, right? Like you know what kind of businesses can move, what kind of you know when can consumers move and where. So the restaurant industry, right, if you're down, I don't know the geography of Seattle that well, but, you know, if you have a, a hot place in downtown Seattle, you probably don't want to move. Um, you know, if you're near the, a border, right, customers may cross the border to go to a restaurant, you know, in the town next door. Um, other kinds of industries can move really easily. I mean, I, it's my, my, my favorite minimum wage, minimum wage anecdote of all time, I'll tell you, after I wrote some op-ed about the minimum wage in L.A., um, some guy calls me up. Says, "Let me tell you about my business." He says, "I'm in the rag business." I said, I said "There's still a rag business." Like I remember the stories about you know immigrants in the Lower East Side in the 1920s. I said, "What's the rag business in L.A.?" He said, "He said, well, I have a couple trucks, and I go out and I buy all the T-shirts and sweatshirts at Venice Beach that they haven't been able to get rid of." 
you know, the ones they printed too many of and don't sell. And we take them back to my little warehouse in LA and we chop them up and we wrap wires around the end and we sell them to machine shops to clean their tools. Right. And he said, he said, I'll tell you two things. And first of all, all I have here is two trucks and a crappy warehouse. I can move easily. And he said, second of all, this is my favorite. I said, there is no worker too low skilled for this job, <laughs> by which he meant, you know, for him, uh, you know, the minimum wages are going to raise, raise costs and not going to raise productivity. And, and none, of, none of this other stuff about the quality of the job matters. So very different sectors can have very different responses. And I think we haven't really um, paid enough attention to that. And we have all this great geographic data now. We know, you know, we know to longitude and latitude points where where firms are and where they move to. And I, I think that's a, a ripe area for exploration. Okay, thank you for the remark, David. Uh, does anyone have any, any final remark you want to say before we finish our webinar? Scott or Hillary? I appreciate the, the conversation. Um, I like seeing the updated elasticity analysis that David produced. We used to teach an older version of that, so it's cool to see a, a, an update. Um, and, and I also, everybody just know, Ho Young has research in this area too. So reach out, connect with her um, uh, as well. Yeah, Ho Young, it's so uh, wonderful to know that you're also studying Seattle's minimum wage. I think just giving some more perspectives is always a great thing for research. So um, everyone keep an eye out for her. Okay, thank you so much all. And we hope uh, we, you had a great time today and learn about minimum wage and need more time to think about it. Thank you. Thank you.